the way you feel about everything, every minute of every day is only down to two things. The pictures you make in your head and the words you say. The mind learns by repetition. The mind couldn't care less what you tell it, it lets it in. And it's really time to upgrade your thoughts, upgrade your beliefs, upgrade the way you talk to yourself. Most people don't even get there. You have to understand thoughts are things. When you think a thought, you have an immediate reaction. That's mm -hmm. why if you think about eating, your you're stomach hungry. rumbles. Yeah. You think about sex, you get aroused. People say, I, I don't believe that. So well, what do you think an erection is? You think a thought, you get a physical reaction. That's not a one-off. If you think a thought, a thought has a physical reaction mm. in your body immediately and an emotional response. If I think I'm embarrassed, I might blush. If you say something moving, my eyes might fill up with tears because my body is reacting to thoughts. And if we could all be taught that early on, you react to thoughts, that's a fact. Here's another great fact. You can change your thoughts anytime you like. And if you change your thinking, it changes your entire life. So for instance, we're all saying I'm stuck at home. I go, no, I'm safe at home, mm -hmm. stuck, safe. You change one little word, it changes everything. So we say, I'm trapped, I'm in a lockdown. You know, we're not actually trapped. They're not sealing up the doors like they did in the plague. In the plague, they sealed your doors and you couldn't physically get out. But we are asked to stay indoors. We still go out for walks, we go out to the store, we go to the pharmacy. We're not stuck, we're not locked in, we're not trapped, we're not in prison. It's not an apocalypse. It's not Armageddon, but if you start to use those mm. words, it begins to feel exactly as if it is that case. Mm. So it's really important that you change your words. And I learned that when I was helping a hospital who had people who couldn't go in the scanning machine. And they'd all say things like, well, I feel like I'm in a coffin. You know, when I get in that scanner and I can't move, I'm so trapped. I'm like, look, come on. You lie in bed for eight hours every night and don't move. Why don't you just say I'm in my bed, I'm super chilled mm. and I feel so relaxed. And what will happen is your mind will react to your thinking. And so I had many people do that and I was teaching nurses how to get people to do that, especially little kids of mm. six going into the scan. And they said, you know, when we tell them they're in their bed, they actually fall asleep in there. And we say, we're gonna play a game now of statues. How <coughs> long can you keep still, still for? So when I actually, a few years ago was in a scanner, which I didn't ever plan to be. And I thought, well, this, let me play a game with So I lay this, in yeah. there and I went, I'm in my bed, I'm so chilled, this is so great. I've got half an hour to just lie here. And then I decided to go, I'm in my coffin now. And they start to talk to me, Marissa, you're moving all the time. I had no idea because I was saying, I'm, I'm stuck, I'm trapped, I'm claustrophobic. My body was like, get out and it starts to do things to make you want to leave. And so if you just understand mm. um, how you are, everything changes. So our ancestral brain is like flee, fight, freeze. I can fight, I can flee, I can freeze. So I'm in a scanner and it's like, well, I need to flee this, I need to fight mm. it. And I'm like, no, if you can't fight and you can't flee, don't freeze, flow. Mm. I can't fight, I can't flee, but I can flow. I mean, Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in solitary confinement. We can't even do three weeks, but oh, it's hell. <laughs> it's a nightmare. I'm cooped up. My kids are driving me mad. I, I want to get a divorce. I can't stand it. But he did 27 years. You know how he did it? Because he said, everyone in my country is in prison. I'm just in a different prison to them. If they can do it, I can do it. And I'm gonna come out here the leader of my country. Wow. And he did. So, you know, we, we have this belief that events affect us. They don't. The meaning you attach to an event affects you. The interpretation you choose about an event is what affects you. So some people are going, I love it, it's great. You know, I'm so much time, I'm having the best. Some people go, I hate it, I can't stand it. I'm, climbing the walls, I'm going cray, I'm ripping my hair out. None of which we're not actually ripping out our hair or climbing the walls or going insane. We shouldn't use that. But 
clearly it must be the interpretation because we're all mm. reacting differently. <clears throat> so an, this won't affect you, but what you make of it will. And it's your job to change the interpretation. And if you can change the interpretation, it will change your entire life. How do we change the interpretation to go from flee yeah. or fight to freeze to flow? Well, you first of all think, what does this mean? What does this mean? You know, I, I've had a couple of clients who went to jail and they reacted into it. One of them was a very rich woman who went to jail for tax evasion. And she said, actually, she ended up really liking it. Being she in lived, jail. Well, she was a typical rich woman. She had a beautiful house, lots of staff. She didn't really go anywhere. Everyone did everything for her. She didn't really have any friends. She had the ladies who lunch. And when she was there, she trained to be an aerobic teacher. She trained to be a yoga teacher, nothing else to do. She really bonded with the other women. And when she got out, she went back every week to visit them because she said, you know, it was different in there. It was like girls' boarding school. I didn't realize I was isolated at home. Mm and more connected in jail, which is an interesting way to think about yeah. it. And people who, often people who've been in jail or been trapped in their house when in lockdown. So Isaac <coughs> Newton, I believe in 1665, he developed the theory of gravity while London was locked down because of the plague, mm. sealed in their house. And so he used that time. So I guess you have to think, well, you know, I can't change this, but I can change what it means. One day I look back and go, well, actually there was a lot of good stuff. What can mm -hmm. I do about it? I mean, we all go, I just haven't got enough time. Oh, I'd love more time. If I only I had time to myself, well, here it is. What could you do or learn or achieve? And I'm not saying it's easy because I'm also safe at home and I really miss going out and meeting people, but I'm also doing things I've wanted to do for years that I couldn't do because of time. So silly things like cook with your kids and make that a math lesson. How much does that weigh? How much vitamin C is in the mm. skin of a potato? Do the laundry, you know, why do you think detergents are called biological? Uh, you can make it interesting. You just have to really decide, okay, what does this mean to me? And can I change the meaning? And when I can change the meaning, it will change my life because the meaning is yours to change and the interpretation is yours to change. But the fastest way is to look at words. Am I saying apocalypse, Armageddon, uh, trapped, stuck? Someone said to me, they've, they've taken away my freedom. Who? The government. Government <laughs> forces have taken away my freedom. Maybe, but how about mm -hmm. they want me to live? They want me to be safe. The government has put this in place to keep me safe. So I'm safe at home or they've taken away my freedom. Mm. Why, why looking at your words first? Why is that so important? Because the way you feel about everything is down to two things, the pictures you make in your head and the words. The way you feel about everything, every minute of every day is only down to two things, the pictures you make in your head and the words you say. But you could make that even simpler and say, forget about the pictures, because the words make the picture. You know, a lot of us, I'm not visual and I can't see stuff, but if I said to you, Lewis, think of anything, but you may not think of an orange snowman, especially one whose snow is the same color as the carrot in his nose. Mm -hmm. You've got to think of an orange snowman. And so when you hear words, they make pictures. When you say, don't think about blushing. Don't think about falling. You know, I paddleboard every day, and I notice if you go, oh God, I'm, I'm wobbling here, and I'm going to fall. I've never, ever, ever fallen off because I don't think about falling. I think about balance and mm. how much I like it. But when you say a word, you make a picture. And even the words you use in front of words make a picture. You can say, this is driving me crazy. I'm going insane there's a picture. Or you can say, it's a challenge, it's interesting, it's an opportunity, because they don't make a picture. So when you say, I've got this cracking headache, oh my God, it's killing me, I'm in agony, my head is killing me. Swelling, it's throbbing, yeah. yeah. Or you say, I've got a little niggle here. Mm. A little niggle, not great, but so what? When you say, I'm starving, this is what people do, <laughs> come in the house, I'm starving. <laughs> I could eat a horse. I'm dying of hunger. See, what you're doing, which most people don't know, is that 500 years ago, the thing that killed us more than anything else 
was not disease and it wasn't war, it was hunger. Mm. And we're wired to be scared of hunger. So when you say to your body, I'm starving, I I'm dying of hunger, I could eat a horse, your mind goes, oh, that's that dangerous thing that could kill you. You have an appetite here that regulates what you eat. But if you say you're starving, I'll put that on hold so you can eat. You yeah, stand so in front much. of the yeah. fridge and eat so much stuff. And then when you've eaten, you still feel hungry because you just told me you were starving. So you're saying that the, using the words, I'm starving or I'm okay, I don't need yeah. food. Whatever well, you say yeah. is going to manifest in the body. And you just have to think, how could I change? Am I really starving? I don't think I've ever been starving. I mean, I've been hungry, but I've never been starving. Could I really eat a horse? No, not even a horse's leg. Of course you couldn't. Am I really dying of hunger? That takes at least 12 days, probably yeah. even longer. So then you think, why would I lie to myself and mm. delude myself? How about saying the truth? I need to eat. I'm ready to eat. And you see what happens is maybe you're driving home or maybe you're on the train station and you say, I'm starving. Now your mind goes, there's a Kit Kat <clears throat> machine right there. You should eat three of those. And maybe some jelly beans and taco mm -hmm. chips as well because you're starving. And I'm your mind and my job is to keep you alive. And you just said you're starving because your mind's job is to listen to your words and your job, and it's a great job, is to tell it better stuff. So then mm. instead you go, you know, I am hungry, I need to eat, but I've got some chicken in my house, I've got some vegetables, I've got a casserole, I cooked it yesterday, I can wait an hour mm. and eat better food. And we all have to say that, I am hungry, but I'm choosing to wait 30 minutes for better food. You know, it's the same thing in a restaurant but when I go to restaurants, I'm not hungry. The minute I sit down, they bring that bed, bread basket. I think, oh, oh, I need that. And I could have eaten all of those at one time until I learned to say, I'm choosing to wait half an hour to eat this really nice food I've ordered. Yeah. But you have to talk to yourself. You know, we're all taught. If you can um, talk to your customers, you'll have a great business. If you can talk to your kids, you'll be a great parent. But no one says, but you need to talk to yourself. That is the most important conversation you'll ever have, the one you have with yourself. This relationship is killing me. This kid is killing me. I'm dying under my workload. This free weight makes me want to die. This is not true. Why don't you say the truth? That the, the, the it's, community it's challenging. is a, it's a challenge. Yeah. I've got all these audio books, isn't I? I've got some snacks in my car. I'm prepared for the challenge rather than it's killing me. So what happens when we say this is killing me over and over again? What happens? Well, how do we manifest that? Yeah, if you say that your mind, your mind's job is to keep you alive on the planet. It doesn't actually care if you're happy. You know, people think my mind's job is to make me happy. No, it's not. It's to make you live long enough to reproduce yourself. And actually that takes the first 30s. So we've got another 70 left. So our mind's job is a little confusing to our mind. <laughs> But, you know, we are ancestral people in very modern bodies. And when you say, my job is killing me, it goes, don't go to that place called job. Mm. And if you keep going to that place called job and keep saying it's killing you, I'll just give you a nice ulcer. I'll keep you at home now. I'll make I'll, you sick. I'll, I'll give make you, a you disease. sick. I'll, I'll give you a disease. And, and we see that people say, oh, I need a week in bed. And then they get flu. Now they've got their week in bed. I, I need to get out of that meeting. And now they get chronic diarrhea. So it happens all the time anyway. And because your mind is designed to keep you alive. And so if you say you hate something, like people say, you know, this guy, oh, he ripped out my heart, stamped all over it, and threw it in the trash. Really? I think he got bored with you, darling. And you know what? If you stuck around, you probably would have got bored with him. He was just your starter relationship. He right. taught you a lot and you learned a lot and everything he loved in you, but he didn't take it when he packed his wash bag and left. He didn't put in it all the things that made him like you. They're still in you. He couldn't take them home. And everything he liked in you is still there. And you can find a way better person that loves you more but when you say to your mind, he ripped out my heart, stamped all over it, he killed me, the mind goes, you know what? Don't have another relationship. Mm. Stay single. I'll make you the you biggest bitch in the man. world. Yeah, you... I'll make you the cold, <clears throat> most cold-hearted guy. Because you keep saying, if I meet another person that leaves me, I'll die. If I meet another person, 
that hurts me. I couldn't take the pain. Yeah. You know those songs, I haven't got time for the pain. I can't live without you. When you say to your mind, it'll kill me if another guy dumps me, or girl, mm -hmm. I'll die if I get rejected. <clears throat> If I have another miscarriage, it will just be the end of the world for me. You've told your mind, I couldn't cope with that event, and your mind's job mm. is okay. My job is to make sure you never have to experience that event ever, ever, ever again. So I'm going to make you uh, a bitch, I'm going to yeah. make you mean, Infertile. I'm going to make you obese, yeah. unattractive, all yeah. these things. You know, right? I worked with someone, it was so fascinating, this girl had hypersensitivity to light so bad that she couldn't go out in normal daylight. And when I talked to her, she said, you know, when I was 11, I got really, really badly bullied. And I said to my mom, can I stay home? And she's like, no, I'm a single parent. Of course you can't stay home. Yeah. I got to go to work and I hate my job and you have to go to school and deal with it. And she said, but mom, I, I, I need to stay home. No. When she got high polite sensitivity, what do you think happened? She was able to stay home. She had to stay she home to. every day. Her mind believed that staying home was what she wanted and was really seductive. And we have to be so careful when we say, I want to be at home. I, I, I don't want to go out into the world and deal with that. It's too much for me. And recently I was teaching, because I teach RTT all over the world, and I was teaching my course, and, and I heard this story, I, I just trained a graduate, and I was so proud of it, because she said, you know, my first client was an anorexic girl. And when I talked to her, using RTT, I said, what, because we always say the same thing, what was going on when you first began to have this? It's called, what I call what lies beneath. And she said, um, well, I was 11 years old, and opened my dad studying, and he was looking at porn, and he was panting, you know, like a dog. And I remember standing at the door thinking, oh, I never want anyone to look at me the way he's looking at that girl. Wow. I would die if a man looked at me the way my dad is looking at that girl. Now that's an, actually a command to the mind. Do anything and everything to make sure no man ever looks at me this the way, way he's yeah. looking at her. And that's when she became anorexic. When you're mm. anorexic, the ovaries don't develop. You don't go into, you don't get breasts. You, you lose your hair. But what was even more interesting is the girl in the audience said, that's so bizarre, because I'm bulimic. And my dad used to, I used to, he used to drop me off when they divorced, and he'd go, look at your mom, look at her in those tight clothes. Who does she think she is? She just looks like a tramp. She says, and I thought, I never want my husband to ever talk about me like that. And I'm so fat, oh my God. he would never talk about me like that. So same, almost the same scenario, the same request of the mind, I couldn't cope if anyone spoke about me like that. And one became anorexic and one became obese because the mind took the command, do anything and everything to make sure no one mm. ever looks at me like yeah, that. to protect yourself. And it doesn't yeah. have a set thing, but um, what is interesting is we in RTT have something called role, function, purpose. So we say to people, if this headache had a role, what would it be? If um, your irritable bowel had a role, if these panic attacks had a purpose, and they come up with the most profound stuff, but it's only ever three things in 30 years. It's always the same three. The panic attacks protect me. You know, my dad wanted me to be a family lawyer like him, but when I got panic attacks, he said, oh, you could never do that. No, you can't. How could you ever be in court with panic attacks? So they protected me from this expectation mm -hmm. I knew I could never meet. The second thing is they punish me. You think, why would my mind punish me? But when I talk to people, they go, yeah, you know, I had an affair with my friend's boyfriend and I, it, it caused so many problems and now I've got colitis, I've got autoimmune, which means the body is attacking itself. When I was 15, I stole money from my mum's purse and then I never told her, but ever since I've had this chronic irritable bowel, these terrible mm. headaches, I blush all the time. You know, years ago we used to go to do penance, we were, used to wear hair shirts, but if you have guilt, your mind's job is to become judge, you're a jailer, let me punish you. So 
punishing ourselves is, is huge. A lot of people do it, they don't even know why. And the third thing is get attention. Mm. You've all seen kids lying on the floor in the store screaming because they want attention. That was me. Getting sick because they want <laughs> attention. Yeah. You know, many, many children who can't get, if you can't get the love of your parents, the very next best thing is to be sick. It's almost as they good. They have to pay attention. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think my mum loved me, but she's driving all over town buying this gluten-free flour, getting this special cream, doing something. And, and for many kids, being sick is like, oh, I didn't think I mattered, but clearly I do. Now you've got all this special stuff in the house. Well, I so the more sick energy. I get, yeah, the, the more, more attention hurt, I get. The more, yeah. And those children tend to become life's hypochondriacs and my mother in England in the war they evacuated children they took all the children from cities put them on trains sent to the country and people had to take you in they had no choice and some of them had a great time some of them had an awful time but my mum didn't like it and she stopped eating she got covered in boils hmm. she was really sick she was the only one who was allowed to go home early and she never ever her whole life gave up being sick I used to talk to her really and, <clears throat> it, it, it met all her needs. She got so much attention. She's the only person I know, I'd go and see her in a hospital, she'd sit up in bed and she was, oh, the doctor's very worried about me, you know, he thinks it's really serious. And, and she would speak with such a sparkle in her eyes and she was really? so happy. She loved being in hospital. And I remember my little girl saying to her one day, Grandma, what are all these pills? And she'd go, well, that's for my legs. That's for my headaches, that's my irritable well, that's for my allergies, that's for my foot. You go, but Grandma, how do they all know where to go? Which I thought was a great... That's funny. Yeah. And my little girl came back from my mother's one. She went, Mommy, I've got my tension headache. I'm like, no, darling, you're five. We don't have tension headaches. <laughs> yeah. That's a grandma thing. Yeah. But one weekend with my mother and she'd go, oh, I've got a tension headache. Oh, this is all going to go wrong. Oh, that's giving me a stomach ache because children learn what they we're live. Yeah, we're and my yeah. mum was a lovely, lovely woman, but she was so invested in being ill. And you know, weekend in her company, by osmosis, my little girl picked all of that up. Mm. And then she said to me one day, you know, Phaedra's very um, active. I think you need to put her on Ritalin. I'm like, she's a child mum. Your mum. Wow. Yeah. I said, I'm going to drug her. She's like a puppy. They're, it's called being age appropriate. They run, they, they jump, energy. Yeah. they touch stuff. Why would I drug her? But, um, you know, my mother learned. Many years ago I was attending someone else's talk and this girl put her hand up and said, you know, the problem is I binge and I'm destructive. And he went, oh yeah, that, you just don't love yourself. And what you have to do is love yourself and then you'll be fine. And then he went to the next person. I'm like, but you didn't tell her how to love herself. And most people have no idea, A, that they don't feel lovable. And even if they do, they just don't know what loving yourself means. And that's not surprising because in order to love yourself, there's a particular technique. I'm going to take you through it today. We're all going to do it. Because when you can love yourself, your life changes beyond recognition. You know, you're going to be with yourself for the rest of your life. And if you don't love yourself, that's imagine being married to someone you don't like and going, well, I'm going to be sticking with this person for 60 years. That's really hard. But you having a relationship with you forever. And if you fall in love with yourself, it's a whole new world. And falling in love with yourself is amazing because, first of all, it's a love affair that never dims never wanes, never disappoints. You don't have to shave your legs or any kind of waxing to turn up. You don't have to get dressed up or pretend you're someone else to fall in love with yourself. And here's the big problem with love in the modern world as I see it. We, we form these beliefs. In order to get love, I have to earn it. I gotta be good. I gotta be beautiful. I gotta have shaved legs or a, a really successful job. So I have to earn love. I have to run after love and chase love and, and try to find love. And then I've got to work so hard to keep it. And none of that is true. Love is not to be chased, to be worked for, to be earned. It's not to be bought or paid for. And it's a great shame that in the Western world, especially, we attach all these conditions. I'm lovable if, if I've got thin thighs and big hair. But what if I've got big thighs and thin hair? What does that mean? I'm not lovable? No, it doesn't. But when you read magazines, 
and watch TV shows, we fall into this trap of what lovable is. So we all want love. And, you know, I went through my formative years not really feeling lovable at all. I didn't feel very significant to my parents. They had their own unhappy marriage. I felt hideously ugly. And I didn't feel particularly bright or gifted at anything. But I had one person who believed in my grandmother. And I always think if you have one person who believes in you, then that's enough. But I also had myself. And as I got older, I, I began to believe in myself. And, and my life changed dramatically. But let me take you right now into, first of all, why we start to lose our lovability and, and how to get it back. So cast your mind back if you are parents the day your baby was born. Or if you're not parents, think about any baby you may have met. You know, I used to push my little girl along the street in a stroller. I think that's, no, Australians are like Brits. They say push chairs. So I can go back. So you used to, I don't think anyone's American. I used to push my daughter along the street in a little bit. would come and go, oh, oh my God, she's so lovely. She has the longest legs. Isn't she cute? She never went, don't look at me. I got a bad head. I've got milk spots. Um, she would just kick her little legs and gurgle. And of course, when you are born, for all of us, the first thing that happens after we take a breath is that people come and look at us. The doctor looks, us, checks everything is there. The nurses look, mum looks, dad looks. Maybe you're a single mum. People then come to visit you and the first thing is, let me see the baby. Oh, what a great baby. And they look in the crib and they tickle their tummy, hold their little finger, stroke their hair. And no baby, to my knowledge, ever says, please don't look at me. My nose is leaking, my butt's leaking, my ears are leaking, my eyes are leaking, I'm vomiting. They just lap it up because we are all born with a belief, I am lovable. And if you've ever got a kitten or a puppy, you'll see the same thing. I took a kitten in that had had its tail burnt off and it never for one minute thought it was less lovable because it didn't have a tail. He didn't know anything else except to think it was lovable. It would wind itself around my leg, come and lie on me climb up right onto my shoulder and it was tiny because it thought it was lovable and it would turn up on my lap and go, here I am. And your job is to see I'm lovable and a baby will do the same thing. Here I am. And your job is to celebrate that I'm lovable. And only if you kick that cat or push it away or kick that puppy or constantly say to the baby, I'm busy, go away, stop bothering me. Why are you so naughty? Do they form a different belief? Oh, no. Perhaps I'm not lovable. These people shout at me. They don't like me. They don't celebrate me. Because a baby is born expecting to be celebrated. No baby says, gosh, my mom is really tired and my dad's working a night shift, so I shouldn't really wake up in the middle of the night and disturb them. No baby says, you know, my mom went to Whole Foods and bought this organic broccoli and I don't like it, but I should eat it because it might upset her. Babies are focused on their own love. They spit out food. They throw up all over their brand new dress, your brand new dress. They wake you up when they want to be woken up and they fall asleep when they want to fall asleep and they expect to be celebrated. And the very good news is you came onto the planet fully expecting to be celebrated. And many of us, including me, weren't celebrated. We heard the other stuff. What's wrong with you? Why can't you do that? Why can't you get, why aren't you like your sister? Your brother, he could tie his own shoelaces at five. Your sister, she was so neat and tidy. Your brother would eat anything I gave him. Your sister never made a mess. Or maybe your cousin or your friend. And we start to get compared. And the comparison chips away at our belief that we're lovable. And we start to think, mm, maybe I'm not. And then parents say these weird things to children. I love you because you're so clever. I love you because you're so smart. I love you because you're good. And you see, when you label a child, you limit them. Even a good label, I love you because you're beautiful. You know what the child is? Mm. And if I wasn't, you wouldn't. I love you because you're clever. Right. And if I wasn't, you wouldn't. I love you because you're good. I worked with a girl just in April who had absolutely suicidal depression. She turned up on my course and kept telling everyone she wanted to kill herself. And so she came up and we had a look at her history and she said that when she was born, her mother told her this story, oh, your brother, he was such a terrible baby. 
He got everything wrong. He was up all night, slept all day. He nearly killed me. He was a nightmare. He was a problem child. And she heard, gosh, well, if he nearly killed her, I can't come along with him. I must be good. And she was so good, always good. Always a good girl, never made a fuss, never made an issue, got good grades, tidied the house, didn't date boys, and then married and was still a good girl and was trying to be so good it was actually killing her. And in that one session, we removed the need that she must be good because it was affecting her marriage, her parenting skills, and her relationship with her parents, who were both teachers, by the way, and wouldn't just tell her she must be good. They'd come home and say, oh, we have this one child in the class. What a joy it is. This child is so clever, so smart, so kind, so good. And so she heard this message a lot. So when you label a child, you limit them. I had a stunningly beautiful girl who came to see me. She said, I, I just can't find love. I, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I can't find love. Every guy I date never wants to see me again. They all disappoint me. And she was very pretty. And men are superficial, sorry, but in the beginning we go for looks. That's not enough to keep a relationship. But the fact that she didn't get a second date was a little odd. And when I took her back, she went back to the same scene over and over again. Her dad would sit her on his knee and go, nobody will ever love you like I do. You will never, ever find anyone to love you like me. Nobody could love you. It's not possible. And he loved her so much, he'd tell her this every time. You never find anyone to love you like me. No man will ever love you like I do. It's not possible for any man to love you like me. When you have a small child and an authority figure and a repeated message, it becomes an imprint. And her imprint was, you'll never find anyone to love you like me. And she didn't. And I remembered her when I was holding my baby and my best friend had a baby at the same time and we were feeding our babies. And she started to say, you'll never find anyone to love you like me. Nobody will ever love you as much as me. Nobody could ever love you like I do. And I said, Philippa, stop saying that. Here's what you say to a baby. You know, I don't want to be bossy here. You're a new mom, so am I. But I've had so many clients in my office in tears and they always go back to that programming. And I said, what you say to a baby is, I love you so much because you are lovable and your whole life you'll find people who love you because you're lovable. I told that to my daughter over and over again. She still had issues with crazy boys that hurt her, but she always felt she deserved more. She felt she deserved better. She knew she was lovable. So with well-meaning parents who say, you'll never find love like me. Nobody could love you like that. Or... Here's another issue. You see mum crying all the time because she's let down by a guy. And then another guy lets her down. And that child forms belief, love hurts. Love is painful. Here's that song, love hurts, love wounds, love bruises. As we hear all these songs, I'm dying without love. I can't live without your love. And so we, we form these beliefs. Oh, love is that painful thing. My mum is always crying. My dad is always fighting, saying, you trap me, this is hell. Maybe your mother is saying that. Be very careful here about doing this gender stereotyping. I know we have people who are in love with the same sex. My children's godparents were gay because I knew they'd be great godparents because they decided not to have their own children, and they are to this day. So it doesn't matter what kind of love you want. It's not about the gender, it's about your belief. And then we have a third one. So we have the well-meaning parents who say you'll never find love. We have the parents whose own love relationship is a car crash. And we look at that and go, oh, I don't want that. Oh, I'd rather be my own than have that. And then people say, you know, oh my God, it killed me when that relationship ended. I'd rather die than go through it again. Then we have group three where people say, well, you know, if you keep eating cake, you'll get fat. Nobody will love you. If you keep doing that, you won't find love. Don't ever let that person see you walking around like that with uncombed hair and hairy legs because they won't like that. And, and my mother said that to me one day, my boyfriend was telling I was in a dressing gown. She went, oh, get dressed. He won't love you if you look like that. I said, no, he will love me however I look. But both my mother and grandmother said to me, quick, run upstairs, do your hair, take off that dressing gown. He won't love you if you don't look perfect. And then we have far worse things. One of my clients said her father said, well, no one's going to love you. You're like your mother. You've got nothing to offer a guy. So we get this message. And then we get an even worse message from magazines 
you get love if you're perfect. If you look, magazines do so much damage. The internet does so much damage. We're exposed over and over again to fake images of what a lovable person looks like. Shiny, glossy hair, perfect breasts, super skinny, always smiling, perfect teeth. It's not really like that. But the media tells us it is. So that's how you buy into I'm not lovable. You read magazines, you watch TV shows, you watch Friends. I mean, who's ever met a waitress who lives in Central Park? Not me. <coughs> but we see these problems. We think, well, I'm not lovable. We compare ourselves to images that are fake. How do you tell yourself you're lovable? I'm going to give you three things. That you do. The first thing is you look in the mirror every day and you go, hey, there you are, you lovable creature. <coughs> you might say, I feel a bit stupid doing that. Who cares? Do you look in there and go, oh my God, there you are. Look at your hair. You should have put more makeup on or, you know, that doesn't suit you or, gosh, you know, you should have got a better outfit. That shirt needs pressing. That tie is <coughs> not a sin. We look in the mirror and we begin the criticism. So I want you every day to look in the mirror and go, there you are. I love you. I know it seems silly. It doesn't matter if it's silly. If it makes you feel lovable and attract a great person, do it because I do anything to find the love of my life. Well, here's the first thing. Look in the mirror and go, I love you. I can't do that. You just said you'd do anything. Yeah, anything but that. No. That's it. That's the first step. It's easy. It's free. It's immediate. It's not painful. Why won't you do that? Well, I don't believe it. I know. That's why you've got to do it. And then you'll believe it. The mind learns by repetition. The mind couldn't care less what you tell it. It lets it in. So the first thing you must do, and I want you to commit to doing it, is to say, there you are. I love you. There you are. You're lovable. You know, I do yoga a lot. And I find that I bend over. When I stand up, I sort of go, oh, there you are. Hi, there you are, you lovable thing. And I do that a lot. In fact, I don't really need to do it now because I've done it so much that I'm okay. I had an agony column on Cosmo. And girls would write to me and go, oh, you know, I met this guy and he loved me. Now he's dumped me and now I'm nothing. I'm worthless without him. And I tell them the truth, listen, everything he liked about you is still in you. Yes, he left you but everything he said I love your hair I love your voice you're so funny you're so sexy you're so interesting it's not gone away he's gone away she's gone away but what they loved in you is still there and the most important word you'll ever hear in your whole life and not what some guy or girl told you is what you tell you other people can say I love you you're amazing you go oh I'm so happy I found someone to love me and then they leave and you go now I'm miserable because they took their love away. They gave me their love and then they took it away. You know, you gave them your power to allow them to make you feel lovable. And if you give that power to someone else, you give them the same power to take it away. You took your love away. Don't take your love away. I'll die without your love. I can't live without you. Yes, you can. I've been dumped. I've been very painfully dumped. I know what it's like to wake up and go, oh, because someone I loved has walked out. I was a single parent. I brought my daughter up on my own for some time. And I, so I definitely know what it's like to be left, to be rejected. But I also began to realize that only I can make myself feel lovable. So the first thing, you have got to look in the mirror and go, I love you. I love you. Don't say I love you because, because today you're thinner. Today you've got on nice clothes. Today you look better. Just, I love you. It's unconditional love. You'd never say to her, I love you. Because today, I would never say to my husband, I love you because you've got a nice shirt on. I love you because you look nice. I love you because you emptied the dishwasher. I love you because you went out and bought me some coffee. That would be a terrible thing. I love him because he's him. And he loves me because I'm me. And you love your friends with all their faults and you love your kids. Who would say to you, kid, I love you because you're earning my love and you've got to earn it, you've got to work for it, you've got to deserve it, you've got to chase it. No, I love you is unconditional. That's the first thing you do, I love you. And I want you to repeat some things after me right now and they may feel silly, funny, they may stick in your throat, I don't care. The mind learns by repetition, let's go. I want you to say, I accept myself as lovable. Say it right now. I 
accept myself as lovable. And now let's do another one. I see myself as lovable. Let's say it together. I see myself as lovable. I believe in myself as lovable. Remember the most important words you will ever hear in your entire life are the words you say to yourself. The most important opinion for you is your own opinion. When you know you're lovable, you know what happens? It resonates out there and the world comes back and says, oh, you're lovable, you think so. I think so, lovable is not arrogant. It's the arrogant people don't think they're lovable. They're so busy trying to make you think it because they don't believe it. The people who know it don't go, hey, look at me, look at me, I'm lovable. They don't have any need to shout it from the rooftop. They know it. They know it, they resonate it. It's sexy, confidence is sexy, self-worth is sexy, self-esteem is sexy, so let's go back. I accept myself as lovable, say that. I believe in myself as lovable. I see myself as lovable. I easily give love to others. I easily accept the love that others have for me. I am filled and nourished by the love other people have for me and I fill and nourish other people with my love. So you have to start saying that. You can make yourself a little recording, you can write it on your mirror, you can put it on your screen, so you could put it on your phone alerts. I accept myself as lovable, I believe in myself as lovable, I easily give love to others, I easily accept the love that others have me, I'm filled and nourished by the love that surrounds me and I fill and nourish others with my love. Make that a mantra. I don't really like the word affirmations. I find them very ambiguous. Life's a walk in the park. No, it isn't always. Sometimes it's raining and you step in dog poo and it's not always a walk in the park. But I like what I call statements of truth. And this is your statement of truth. You must say it. You must say it all the time. So you've got point one and two. Look in the mirror. I love you. Repeat those statements. Write them down. Now the third thing, the most important thing about being lovable. I want you to take a minute and think about if you had the best boyfriend, husband in the world, if you had the most phenomenal girlfriend, the best wife anyone could ever have, what would they say? Take a minute. If you had the love of your life who was wildly in love with you, and of course you're in love with them because it's no good having someone that loves you if you don't love them back. But you're perfect person, the one. What would they say to you? They would say stuff like, I love you, because you're you. I, I ring your phone just to hear your voice. <clears throat> I love coming home to you. I love waking up to you. You have the best smile. There's something about you. You know that song, Something in the Way She Moves. You know, great love songs. No one says, I love you because you're a fantastic barrister. I love you because you're the best dentist in Beverly Hills. They say other things, I love you, something in the way you move. I love your voice. I love the curve. I love you. I love you. So what would your ideal person say to you? Maybe even write it down. Get a pen and write down what your ideal love match would say to you. And then start to say it yourself. I love you. I love waking up to you. I love coming home to you. Sounds kind of weird that you're now saying what your ideal guy or girl would say, but when you say things, the mind doesn't go, who's saying that? Well, where's that coming from? It lets it in like lotion on skin. And the fastest way to find love mm -hmm. is to say the stuff you want to hear. You want to be a magnet, a love magnet that attracts love, because when you feel you're lovable, it happens. You know, I, my husband asked me to marry him. We're just coming up to our nine year anniversary tomorrow, actually. So he asked me to marry him and it was very romantic. And the next day I had to fly to Spain and I went through security, put my laptop down. And as I got through, this guy ran up and went, hey, I think you dropped this bit of paper. And I didn't drop a bit of paper. And he said to me, I'm, I'm really sorry, but there's just something about you. I just, I just need to know you and, can I have a coffee with you? I said, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm rushing to get my plane. And he was hitting on me, but I didn't mind. I said, it's so sweet. and Thank you so much. But, you know, I'm getting married. And he said, oh, of course you are. And I said, well, you can get married too, just not to me.
and we had a little chat and I didn't make him feel bad and I got my plane. No one has ever done that to me before and I fly every few weeks, but it was because I just got engaged. I felt so lovable, I felt so wanted, so loved and so desired and it was radiating from me. It was, you know, what is it is so weird relationship like buses. I waited two years to find someone. I found them the next week, someone hit on me and then someone else did. Because you feel lovable if someone loves you, but that someone has to be you. So I want you to think about all the great things you would hear and say them to yourself. You know, I see people do this, I hate Valentine's Day. I hate it, you know, I can't bear seeing all those women walking home with flowers, I haven't got any flowers. Send yourself flowers, send yourself a card. I've had many Valentine's Day without stuff. I buy myself something. I go, yep, yeah, I send myself a Valentine. I see that with my daughter and all her friends, that, oh, if I don't have someone on Christmas Day, on Valentine's, on New Year, you have got someone, you've got you. The, a lifelong romance begins with you. It doesn't end with you. So that's how you know you're lovable. Praise yourself. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that will build your self esteem. Like praise, don't let someone else do it. You look amazing in that dress, but you look really horrible in those pants. No, it's you. Don't give anyone else permission to make you feel lovable or unlovable, you do it. Look in the mirror, say those things, give yourself the praise you've always wanted. And if you're going on a date, before you go, stop and go, I'm lovable. These clothes are great, but I'm lovable. I am lovable, lovable, lovable. If you want to go and talk to someone in a bar or on the street or on a bus stop, Take a minute and go, I'm lovable. I'm a warm, good person. Love is all around you. It's everywhere. It's in the street. It's in the store. It's in a bus stop. I'm going to end very quickly with, I, I'm, Cosmo Gordon asked me to make a recording on being lovable because I was their agony on. And I did. And people wrote to me and said, just the weirdest thing. I listened to that recording. And the next door neighbor came up to me. I'd lived next to this guy for four years. I'd never even seen him. He'd never seen me. And suddenly, I don't know, the stars collided. He was in my way. I was in his. And we're together. Someone else, I listened to that recording. I went to my supermarket. And someone came up and went, I'm really sorry. I don't do this. But there's just something about you. And can I talk to you? Can I have a coffee with you? And so many people got married from that recording because it made them feel lovable. Whatever you focus on, you get more of. When you focus on you're not lovable, you get more of it. When you focus on I'm lovable. So if someone that you love has left you, remind yourself everything they loved about you is still there and you can find another great person. But in order to find love, don't change your hair, your weight, your shape, your size. There's one thing you need to find love, one. And here it is believe you are worth it. Tell yourself you're lovable. I mean, if you look like Angelina Jolie, does that make you love, love Jennifer Aniston? No, some of the most beautiful women in the world get dumped. Some of the most gorgeous guys get left because they don't think they're lovable. The one thing you need to find love, maintain love for the rest of your life, and it isn't just in your marriage to have a great relationship with your in-laws, with your boss, with your friends, with your own kids. You have to know you are lovable. It changes everything forever. So welcome to it. Please do those four things. Don't just listen and go, yeah, that sounds great. Another time, do it now. Have you ever seen a child, especially a baby, say, I'm not enough? Imagine the first day that you're born and people come to the hospital to see you and grandma or aunt or your uncle or brother or sister or dad starts to count your fingers and toes and the doctors and nurses look at you. No baby says, don't look at me. I've got these milk spots. I don't have any teeth. I've got triple knees. I've got a leaking diaper. Babies don't do them. When you look at a baby, they smile their big gummy smile. They kick their little legs. I used to push my little daughter out in her stroller. People are going to go, wow, what a gorgeous baby and she never looked away she would smile her big gummy smile without any teeth and kick her little legs with her triple knees and her chubby ankles and she joined in with them and going hey yeah look at me aren't I the cutest thing and many of us find that hard to even believe really I came onto the planet and I liked attention absolutely in fact babies demand attention they cry in the middle of the night they grab hold of your leg, they insist you pick them up. 
because they have a belief that runs them and it's this belief, I am worth it. So all babies are born with this belief, someone is going to come and meet my needs. Babies will cry for hours because the belief is someone is going to come and take care of me, feed me, change me, hold me, love me, be with me because I'm worth it. No baby says, well, I'm not a rich baby, so I don't deserve love. I don't have designer clothes. I don't have a flat stomach. don't have a thigh gap or a bikini bridge. They don't even know what that is. No baby says, I'm not attractive. I'm not smart. I'm not worthy. I'm not enough. No baby says, well, I'm just a stupid one. I just, I, I just have this self-sabotage. I destroy everything. So it's important to understand that even if you may have forgotten, you were born like every single baby wired to make it. That's why a baby falls down, they get up. They fall down, they get up. They learn to feed themselves. They learn to go to the bathroom. They get it all wrong, but no one says, yeah, you know, I never, never really got to grips with that going to the bathroom thing. It was just so complicated. I, I just gave up. No one does that because babies are wired to keep going, to keep going. They are like magnets wired to succeed at walking, talking, speaking, feeding. And you learn half of what you learn in your entire life before you're five years old. And that should be amazing, except many of us learn way before we're five. Oh, my mum's unhappy, so I'm not enough. My dad left, so I'm not enough. My mother prefers my brother, I guess I'm not enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not worthy enough. I'm not, inter- I'm not good enough. You know, one of my clients, said, the minute she was born, her mother would say, oh, I want an angel, I've got a devil. She's the devil, she's up all night and sleeps all day. She'd be the death of me. She said it in a very joking way, she loved that baby, but the baby picked up, oh, you want an angel? And you got me, people say, oh, your baby's so cute, come back at 2 a.m., you can have it. He's not cute, he's a nightmare, he's the devil. You have no idea what he's like. Or we change the baby's nap, you go, oh, this is so disgusting, oh, yuck. And we forget that babies who are pure sensation pick that up, they pick up our voice tones, they pick up everything. People holding the baby on the hip go, yeah, well, she nearly killed me. I almost died giving birth to her. She ruined my body, ruined my relationship. So often parents say weird things like, I love you so much, I could eat you. That's a really weird thing to say to a baby, I love you so much, I could eat you. But we never stop to think about what we're saying to our children. And often we say these things to protect our child. Don't do that, it will all go wrong. Don't ask for that, you'll never get it. I want, doesn't get. Don't show off, don't draw attention to yourself. Who are you to ask for that? Don't put your hand up all the time. Don't take the attention of other people. And most of our parents do that because they really want to protect us. They're acting off their own limiting beliefs when you start to label a child you're the greedy one you're the noisy one oh this is my problem child I was in the park with a friend and she said this is my problem child she loved that child she had four children this is the problem child and I did have to say very nicely don't keep saying that in front of him because you know you are wiring him to become the problem child that is now his identity And so adults do it to protect us, to keep us safe. They do it as a joke. They do it because they think it's funny. But they pass on these limiting beliefs. People pass on limiting beliefs from parent to child to the next child. And then we begin this negative self-talk, this negative dialogue. I can't. I shouldn't, I mustn't, it's greedy to ask, it's greedy to want, who am I to have more than other people? I shouldn't ask for more, people won't like me if I ask more, nobody will like me if I'm different. I shouldn't show off, I should keep everything in, don't cry, don't have a tantrum, don't make a fuss. 
And the problem is that this is bad enough on its own, but then we develop this limiting self-talk. I better not ask, I might not get. I shouldn't demand, I'll seem greedy. I better be nice, I better be good. I better, be, I better please everyone else because the only way I can get my needs met is to make other people happy. And we have these beliefs that really belong in our childhood. And it's such a shame. But at any time in your life, you can change your beliefs. You can upgrade them and find new ones. You know, I've upgraded my phone. If I hadn't, I'd still have this old Nokia brick. I loved my Nokia brick. And I thought, oh, actually, I don't want that anymore. I think I'll have a Blackberry. I think I'll have an Ericsson. And now I have an Apple. I don't even know what number it is. But I upgrade my phone every time a new, better one comes out. And that is exactly how it should be with your thinking. Upgrade your thoughts. Leave behind the ones that don't work. Don't carry around an old Nokia brick that isn't even charged and go, well, I don't know why this doesn't work. It, it worked 10 years ago. I'm just going to keep pressing the buttons because it's gone. You've upgraded it. And it's really time to upgrade your thoughts, upgrade your beliefs, upgrade the way you talk to yourself, the way you talk to yourself, your self-talk and your self-dialogue will define who you are, where you go and what you do. Yes, someone asks you, oh, hey, you're just the best thing in the world. You're the hottest thing, the smartest thing, the kindest thing. I could say to my assistant, you're the best assistant I've ever had in this company. You're the best. By the way, could you work all weekend? Could you stay late? Because you see, dialogue can manipulate people. So when other people praise you, they might just have an agenda. They don't always, sometimes they do. But when you praise you, there's no agenda. It sinks in whatever you say, good or bad, right or wrong, your mind lets it in. In fact, your mind doesn't care. And it doesn't even know if what you tell it is good or bad, right or wrong, useful or useless, helpful or not empowering or disempowering, true or false. And since that is true, you might as well begin to tell yourself amazing things. You see, you make your beliefs and then your beliefs turn right around and make you. So imagine this, I always mess up. I always get things wrong. I always blow it at the last minute. I seem to forget the most important things. When it comes to talking to people, I go bright red, I break out in a sweat, I panic, and I don't know what to say. Now these are words, and you can choose to say them, but you can also choose to say, I'm phenomenal. I always know what to say. The right things come to me. I'm so at ease around people. I just have a knack for making things work. My life is extraordinary. You can choose to be negative, you can choose to be positive. You know what, you can't choose what you do to your body when you go, that's gonna go wrong. I knew I'd mess that up. Everything I touch falls apart. I'm just a loser. I'm just stupid, I'm an idiot, I got rocks for brains. I always mess it up. You can't choose what that does to you. But you can choose to flip that over I'm wired for success. Success comes to me. I'm naturally good at people. I have a gift for this one thing. I was given this gift. It's what I'm meant to do. I'm really good at it. I can do this. This has my name all over. I can do this. Yes, I'm doing it. This is working out amazing. This is what I was meant to be, meant to do. This has my name. I can do this standing on my head. You see, you might go, well, that's a lie. But so is saying, I've just got rocks for brains, because that's definitely a lie. And if you're gonna tell yourself a lie, how about telling yourself a better lie? Everything I touch falls apart. Whatever I put my mind to, it works out amazingly. Remember, your mind doesn't know, doesn't care. So you might as well tell yourself amazing things. When you change your self-talk, when you change your dialogue, and make it positive, your life becomes extraordinary. Here's a good example. I'm chronically tired, I'm dying of fatigue. Well, that's not true. How about, I'm a little bit tired, I'm also dehydrated. Tonight I'm gonna to have a great night's sleep. Tomorrow, 
I'll be full of energy. I look at a cake and I get fat. That's a lie. Why not say I look at a cake? I don't even like cake, but on the odd times I eat it, I just burn it all off because I've got a fabulous metabolic rate. You're beginning to see that you get to choose. And if you want to learn more about how to really make yourself talk a masterpiece, make yourself dialogue so phenomenal that you can't help but become phenomenal, then please join my 21-day Unstoppable Confidence Challenge where you are going to not just hear me talk, you're going to be invited to take action, to do things, to wire in, fire in, and code in phenomenal habits of being unstoppable. And you will be unstoppable in your relationships, in your career, in your relationship with yourself. That's super important. What kind of relationship do you have with you? How do you talk to yourself? What kind of stuff do you give yourself to eat? Do you take yourself to the gym? Are you kind to yourself? Are you nice to yourself? Do you praise yourself? Because praise builds massive self-esteem and criticism chips away at it and withers it. So join me and learn the habits, the actions, the special things that you can do to make you unstoppable. Join me, make these phenomenal changes be unstoppable, be outstanding. Start right now. You know what else? You get to keep it forever. One of the things I deal with on a regular basis with my clients is this sense of dissatisfaction, needing more. And I've always looked at why are we so dissatisfied with our lives? Because really we have more than our grandparents could have dreamed of. More freedom, more products, more stuff, more things to make our life easy. We have dishwashers and washing machines. We'll say, but I need two dishwashers. I need one so I don't have to empty the other one. We have more of everything. Actually, the thing we don't have more of is sex. Funny enough, our grandparents had more sex than we are having now. But let's go back to why are we so dissatisfied? Why do we need more? Well, it's partly because we've been sold a myth. If you have all this stuff, it will make you feel good. You see, the truth is everything you want to buy or have or acquire almost without exception is because of this. We buy things that we think will make us feel good about ourselves. We have a belief, this will make me feel good. And if we don't feel enough, which is uh, so common, we think, well, I'm not enough. I need more. I need more of everything. So. Take a look around your house right now, mentally in your mind. Just imagine touring around your living room, maybe your bathroom and kitchen. Take a look in your closet, your wardrobe, and look at all the stuff you have, and then have a thought. You know, I already have five Jo Malone candles. I have these cushions, I have these products, I have these bags or shoes or purses or, stuff, I have these gadgets, and if they really made me feel enough, why do I need more? If six candles doesn't make me feel enough, what is 26 going to do? So we have this belief, buying that will make me feel good, acquiring that will make me feel good, achieving that, losing weight, working out, probably will make me feel good, but now why do I need more? Why am I still dissatisfied? I saved up for something, I got something, I bid for something that would make me so happy and I've got it. I need something else. Well, that's because you're looking out there. You see, here's the truth. If you can't control what's going on in here and in here, your thoughts and your feelings, you start to go out there. I just get lots of stuff and it will make me happy, but then you have a problem of acquiring stuff and acquiring stuff. I recently moved to LA, had to empty out a London home I'd had for 20 years. I remember thinking, oh my goodness, nobody needs this amount of stuff. I will never, ever acquire this much stuff again. And my husband was reading Marie Kondo's book and he said, babe, this book is so great. 
it talks about letting go of stuff. I said, oh, where is it? I want to read it. He went, well, I gave it away because I didn't want to have more stuff. So he probably went out and bought it again. I thought that was quite funny. But the truth is if stuff, if things, if products made you happy, you wouldn't need more. Now our grandparents didn't have the media to promote acquiring stuff to feel good about yourself. They had communities and in the lockdown, we've sort of gone back to that a bit, which is great that we suddenly thought, what makes me feel good? Actually people, buying stuff will never make you feel good, but giving stuff away, swapping stuff with friends, that will make you feel so much better. So look at the fact you've been sold a myth. That will make you feel good. That will make you feel good. That will make you feel good. I don't feel good. Well, you need more. More of that and more of that and more of that will make you feel good. And then the stuff starts to run us and we don't feel good. I remember years ago, my daughter had so much stuff, far too much stuff. And I remember someone saying to me, as a great parent, buy less by less and my daughter was one day sitting in the garden. She had two blades of grass and she was playing Bambi and Feline with the two blades of grass and she was so happy because she was using her imagination which children don't use when they are overwhelmed with stuff. And I see that now with children's parties. Children just want to play and have a cake but the parents theme the party. They get into one upmanship, even the party bags have become one upmanship. And we have to look at what we're doing when we're even teaching tiny children to have more and more and more. And one day I was and saw my daughter ran up with an armful of bars and said, Mommy, I need all of these. And I said, Darling, you don't need any of them because you have a Barbie at home and maybe you could have one. She goes, but I need them all. And I had to say, you know, having one will make you just as happy as having six because I was very guilty of buying more. It's a single parent. Oh, I'll buy you more so that you have more. But I could see it was a huge mistake. I had to really pull back from stuff does not make you feel happy. People and experiences make you feel happy. I didn't want her to be the kind of adult who needed more and more stuff because she had learned to use stuff to not feel. I feel sad, let me buy something. I feel low, let me acquire something. Let me go on eBay and bid or Amazon and buy because that's another problem. We have more stuff because we can get it 24 hours a day. We don't have to wait like our grandparents did for the shop to open to travel into town once a month, which was a great treat. I lived in the country and you just didn't buy stuff, but now we can buy stuff 24 hours a day at the click of a button. It's actually really not good for us. So the needing more comes from not feeling enough, feeling you're not enough and you will find freedom and fulfillment and absolute joy when you know with unshakable conviction with unwavering certainty that you are enough. Somebody recently wrote to me and said, I'm really confused, I'm a positive person. And my team are complaining about me now because when they come in and say, well, my cat just died, I go, well, hey, you can get another one. There's so many cats that need homes. I might say, I'm really upset that things aren't working out with my boyfriend. They go, oh, that will pass. And the complaint was that these people don't feel heard. So this was a boss at work and every time her clients came in and said, I'm going through the menopause and I feel awful, they went, oh, well, that's nothing. Just put on a happy face and smile and pretend it doesn't matter. It's like that song, smile when your heart is breaking. It's all worthwhile if you just smile. But you see, that's not strictly true because as humans, we need to be heard. We need so much to feel heard and we need people to be present with us. And when you go to your mother, your father, your boss, your partner and say, I feel so sad, they go, what have you got to feel sad about? Just put on a happy face, turn that frown upside down. We don't feel heard. And I really believe in being positive, but occasionally I also understand Sometimes we need to feel grief. We need to express sadness. We need to say, I'm having a really bad day today. I just feel terrible. 
You know, yesterday my little cat was attacked by two dogs and it was horrible. And for the whole night I kept saying to my husband, I keep seeing her little face, I feel so bad that um, I didn't get her in sooner. It was just becoming dusk and I should have pulled her in and I wish I'd done this and that. And he didn't go, oh, never mind, let's be positive. There are lots more cats that you can find because I needed to express that grief. Many, many years ago, my daughter and I were feeding ducks. And my daughter, I don't know how this happened to this day because we're behind a fence, but she somehow fell in the water. And I took off my shoes and jumped in and got her out and took her home to my mother. We were visiting her and my daughter kept saying, mummy, I thought those ducks were coming to eat me. Mummy, why did you take off your shoes before you jumped in the water? Were you worried about your shoes getting wet? I said, oh no, darling. My shoes were too heavy. I needed to get you as fast as I can. And my mum started to go, don't talk about it anymore. Stop talking about it. I said, no, mum. She clearly needs to express this. She needs to tell me that she thought I cared about my shoes more than her. She needed me to express everything to her. And if I did the toxic positive, it's all good. Let's never mention it. Everything is great. Everything is fine. I would have never understood that I had to validate my daughter's fears. And occasionally when something happens that's awful, we need people to say, you know, I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to get sick. Hey, I I've got a lump. I think I might have cancer. No, don't worry about that. You don't have cancer. And even if you did, you can meditate and wave crystals around and do all this stuff. You see, when someone is ill, when someone has cancer, they need you to say, what can I do? One of my friends said that the thing that annoyed him the most is whenever he told someone he had cancer, they go, oh, you'll be fine. And you go, how do you know? And he got very defensive. How do you know? How can you possibly say that? So when someone tells you, I'm worried about being ill, I'm worried about my partner, I'm worried about my kid, don't go, it'll all be fine. Don't worry. Or even worse, I know how you feel. I had a client whose son was run over and she said, you know what drives me crazy? People go, I know how you feel. And I want to go, really? Has your son been run over? No. Then how could you ever know how they would feel? And as a therapist, people come into me and say, you know, my last therapist, they would say things like, you'll be fine. It's okay. I know how you feel. And people come to me and say, my child died. I tell them the truth. You know what? your life will never be quite the same again. You will have moments of joy. This grief will pass, but it will always be different. It will be happy at times, and you'll still have pleasure, but it won't be the same. And I never, ever say, I know how you feel, because I don't know how it feels. I never want to know how that feels. So the toxic positivity is not listening to someone's grief not hearing someone's pain, not saying, gosh, that sounds awful. What can I do? Can I be an ear? Can I help you in any way? I feel so helpless. My husband yesterday said, I feel so helpless about our little cat. And I said, no, you're doing great because you understand and you've canceled your day just to take her to the vet. And you understand how I feel. And I love that for him because he loved me enough to recognize my worry and to, so he never said, well, let's go and get another one. There are cats all over LA that need, we can find another one. If someone comes and says, my dog's just been run over, you wouldn't go, well, get another one. So the toxic positivity is not tuning into someone's need to talk. And remember what people need, they need to be heard and they need you to be present with them. When someone comes to you as a boss, as a parent, as a partner and says, I feel worried, I feel sad, I feel terrible. When someone says, I feel really unattractive, don't go, oh, you look great. When someone says, I have postnatal depression, don't go, you've just got a baby. What have you got to be depressed about? That's like saying to somebody, what have you got to be diabetic about? You see, here's the thing about your feelings, and it's such a wonderful saying. You must feel your feelings until they no longer require to be felt. You can't Netflix your feelings. 
You can't eat your feelings. You can't drink them. You can't medicate them. You can't show them. You can try, but when you try to eat your feelings, they just regroup and come back stronger and stronger until you take a minute and say, you know what, today I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling bereft. I'm feeling guilty. I'm feeling so bad. I'm feeling bad because I didn't get my cat in at dusk, which I always do. They were having such fun. I left them out there for a few minutes too long and one of them nearly got killed and I feel bad and I feel guilty. But that feeling will make sure I never, ever, ever do that again. So that feeling has taught me a valuable lesson. If my husband said, oh, don't feel guilty. Oh, that's silly. But he didn't. He listened and actually he agreed with me, but not in a bad way. So first of all, you must feel your own feelings until they no longer require to be felt. And then you must hear someone else's. When someone says, I feel so broken hearted by a partner, I have to go, well, he was rubbish. You're so much better off with him. You'll find someone else, plenty more fish in the sea. That is toxic positivity. You're trying to help, of course, by saying, no, you'll find someone else. They were no good. I never liked him. Anyway, guess what? They weren't even nice about you. No, you say, let me hear you out. How awful. You feel abandoned. You feel left. You feel replaced. That's terrible. But remember something. You know everything that person loved in you when they packed their bags and left? Guess what? They didn't take it with them. It's still there. And you need to go through feeling bereft, feeling sad, feeling lonely. And then eventually you'll find someone better. But first you have to feel the feeling. You know, one of my clients, when she told someone her child had died, they said, well, lucky you've got four others. It must hurt less. She said, what? It doesn't hurt less. It's terrible. I've lost my child, when someone said I had a miscarriage, they go, well, you never really got to know that baby. It wasn't really a person. It was only the size of a tangerine. That is toxic positive. You can have another one. Many years ago, my lovely father and I were having a conversation. He said to me, I never, ever worry about you. I know you'll be great. And I said, but I want you to worry about me. That doesn't feel great that you never worry about me. I didn't really hear what he was saying. I heard, oh, I don't worry about you. And I wanted him to worry about me. When I speak to my daughter on the phone, I say, you sound a little sad today. She says, mom, I'm fine. I'm like, okay, well, that's good. But you know, my job is to worry about you. You don't have to tell me anything, but you know, I'm always here for you. And I'll always worry about you because you're my beautiful child. It's my job to worry about you. I know how I felt when my dad says, I never worry about you. And I decided I would never do that to my children. So I do the opposite, not excessively. And when people come to you with issues that you think are silly and trivial and pointless, toxic positivity, to disregard them and to try and make it positive, you must listen. We have two ears and one mouth because we're supposed to listen more and speak less. And you can be a positive person, really positive, but don't be toxic positive. Don't not tune in to what other people that matter to you are feeling. Listen, be open, remember that people want to be heard. You know what else they want to feel significant? They want to feel they matter. And if you don't listen to people's worries, they're going to feel they don't matter to you. And if they matter to you, then what they feel also matters. You know, my mother, her entire life would ring me up and go, I've got another illness, I've got this wrong and that wrong. And my mother was lovely but a hypochondriac. And the first thing I did was go, hey mum, I'm here from a bit of headache, I know this great person, can I send you that? I've heard of this great treatment for your allergies. But I realized that as I got her something to fix an allergy, she just got something else. You know what my mother needed me to do? She needed me to go, oh, I hate that for you. That's awful. You just got rid of one illness and now you got another one. And I learned to do what I call the mm voice because that's what my mother wanted. She didn't want me to fix her. She didn't want me to recommend a doctor, pay for a doctor, pay for drugs, pay for, no. She just wanted to be heard. And my life was improved when I said, oh, 
That's terrible, another illness, poor you. It must feel awful to always be ill and have to take so many pills because that's what she wanted to hear. And I gave her what she wanted, which was not positivity. One day, my daughter called me and said, Mommy, you got a headache. And I said, OK, well, we have some lavender oil. She goes, Mommy, I just want to take medicine like all my friends. I don't want lavender oil or peppermint oil or homeopathic or hypnosis. I just want cowpole like all my friends. So I gave her some. That's what she wanted. I listened to her. She felt less important. All her friends got this pink syrupy medicine. She got lavender oil on the forehead, which worked, but she didn't want it. I gave her a tiny bit of medicine because she wanted it. If someone says, I want you to come with me to the doctor, hold my hand, I want you to call me after and say, hey, what happened? Are you okay? Give them what they want. They go, I know you'll be fine. And by the way, you can meditate. And I don't even believe in illness. And I believe in never discussing it. That's what you want. But it isn't always what other people want. We want to be heard. We want to feel significant. We need to know that we are enough for you to listen to us, allow us to vent or share our worries without you running around fixing them or shutting us down, going, well, let's not mention it. Let's not discuss it. It's never going to happen. It's all for the best. Recently, I heard someone in the back of a car say to someone else, you know, you're bringing this all on yourself. And they were so upset. And I had to intervene and say, look, even if you believe that to be true, it's not a very kind thing to say. This person was talking about how every person let them down. And the other person said, well, you must be creating that. It's your fault. You know it. you can manifest that or not. And that was toxic positivity. The better way is to say, I'm so sorry this is happening. It must feel terrible. It must be awful. How sad to always be let down. And then later say, you know, I wonder if there's something you might be doing that you don't know you're doing that's contributing to always be letting down. It's awful to be let down. It's not your fault, but perhaps we could have a look at something that may be going on here. That's kinder, and that's kind positivity, not toxic positivity. So if you think one of your friends, colleague, family members is a hypochondriac or an excessive worrier, don't say, you know, all of this can be fixed easily with positive thinking. First go into with them, where is this coming from? How is it serving them? And then at the end you can suggest, you know, positive thinking could help you with this. Could I help you to just change a few of your thoughts because it may help with the hypochondria or the illness, or the worry, or the anxiety, but do it with kindness. Someone else's world is not your world. You can have your world of being super positive. That's my world, by the way. But I see people every day with issues, and I never go, oh, hey, let's just be super positive, because that annoys them. It upsets them. They don't feel heard. I listen, I hear them, I acknowledge them, and then I gently introduce them to something by saying, you know, did you always say, I always get headaches. I could do this, but that never works. Nothing ever works for me. I look at why they're saying that, and I help them, but I do it with kindness, niceness, warmth, and empathy. I don't ever try to be superior, and I don't ever get you doing this all wrong, you know. Here's the right way, because if it's right for me, that doesn't mean it's right for them. We kind of know that we should have goals. We know that we should have dreams. Some people say, but I need to have reasonable ones. I don't want to be disappointed. I'm just going to have a little goal, a little dream, and then maybe I can get it. And if I don't, I won't be disappointed. You know what? You will. Here's why. Your potential expands as you move towards it. You cannot know. None of us can know what our potential is because as we move towards our potential, it moves and it moves and it moves. And that's a great thing to know. Oh, I don't know what my potential is because I get to it, it expands. Yes, it does. And here's a wonderful thing. When your mind expands to a new dimension, it never, ever, ever goes back. It keeps going forwards. I used to work with prisoners and they'd say things like, I just, I just want to get out. And if I get out, I could just have a little tiny studio apartment, just a job 
stacking shelves, that's all I want. But then a year later they go, well, you know, this apartment's too small. I need a separate bedroom. I want people to come and stay. I need two bedrooms. And it doesn't challenge me to stack shelves. I need something more. And we see that in the Olympic world where Mark Spitz in the 80s won so many medals. He was Robocop. He was amazing. He was a machine winning all those medals and breaking records and now you know what you can't get into the swimming team swimming at the speed he swam at it's no longer good enough because when he moved to that potential and broke records people followed him when roger bannister ran a mile in under four minutes that same year 27 more people did it too before that it wasn't even possible an athlete, show us our potential. People who, who do amazing things, show us, wow, I'm a human. I could sing like that, soar like that, jump like that. And even if I can't, I'm going to celebrate another human being soaring towards a potential I didn't even know existed. So why should you dream big? Because your mind expands to new dimensions. I mean, people say, you know, I, I've learned to manifest. It's amazing. I manifest parking spaces. How cool is that? I know it's very cool. I do that too. In central London, I will always find a parking space because I tell my mind I'll find it. But I would, if I could do that, why would I stop at a parking space? Expand to bigger, better things. You know, you have a universal brain as you think. Someone else is thinking your thoughts. We see how birds fly and fish swim, and they have a universal brain. Birds fly as a big bird, fish swim as a big fish. And one doesn't go, hey, I'll be the tail, you be the fin. They just move together. And there's a universal brain. That means as you think about inventing something, someone in the world is thinking about it too. The day I began to think about writing a book, I went to a dinner party and I sat next to an editor. That wasn't a fluke. Because when you expand your mind to new dimensions, all kinds of things happen to meet your expectations. And they all stem from the belief, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to write a play, I'm going to do something, produce something. So if you're going to have dreams and goals, make them big. You know that expression, reach for the moon, you'll probably have the stars. Reach higher, dream bigger. Dream bigger and bigger and bigger. Don't dream small. If you have a gift for making things happen, don't think, well, I'm, I'm just going to visualize that meeting being canceled. I don't want to go. I'm dreading going, oh, look, I thought that thought and they canceled it. Yay. How about thinking, well, if I can think that, if I have that much power, why don't I visualize the meeting being amazing and phenomenal and productive and amazing? You see, many people stop with their dream. I want to find love. That's a nice dream. I'm going to find love. For how long? An hour? An afternoon? A night? How about for the rest of your life? How about finding the most amazing love? You know, I, I had a friend. We used to live in Notting Hill. Notting Hill has a lot of rock stars. And in her road was a rock star. And she used to sing this song, I want, I want that man. It was a big hit at the time. And she said, I want him. I want him. I want him in my bed. I want him. And what happened is one day he got a bit drunk and he rang the wrong doorbell. She opened the door and there he was. And he was in her bed and they had a wonderful time and she never saw him again. I'm like, but why did you stop at that? You manifested him. You dreamt of him and he turned up. You could have had him forever if you dreamt bigger. We're going to meet. Our hearts and souls are going to collide. He's going to see that I'm the most amazing woman in the whole world for him. We're going to be together for the rest of our lives. We're going to grow in love. He's my soulmate. You saw him. You connected with him at some level. He turned up on your doorstep and he left after one night because you didn't dream a big enough dream. I want more money. Hang on a minute. I might have $10 in my pocket. Is that? No, that's not my dream will make your dream specific. I want a million dollars. And by the way, what do you want it for? Well, I'm going to create a product. I'm going to make something. I'm going to monetize. I'm going to do something. And when I get that million dollars, I'm going to help more people, employ people, give more people help. Because the bigger you make your dream, 
the more you will manifest. If you want to be an Olympic athlete, that's a big dream. You're going to go to the Olympics, break a world record, but you have to go out and train and practice and do stuff. But if you have a dream that's big, you can go towards it. And when Whoopi Goldberg won an Oscar and held it up, she said, for every little black kid in the projects, dream big. Don't ever let someone say you can't do that. When someone said to Danny DeVito, Danny, you'll never be a movie star, and I will. When someone said to Naomi Campbell, black girls don't get on the cover of Oak, that door shut, she went, I'll kick it open. And I love that about her because she said, no, you are not going to stop my dream. I got very ill in the middle of my career and my doctor said, you know, you can't go to Costa Rica and give this talk. I said, no, that's my dream. He said, well, you can't fly when I go on a boat. I don't care how long it takes. I am not giving up my dream. I'm going no matter what it takes. I'll go by boat and train like if it takes me a week. I am going. And he went, you know what? I'm going to let you go. I'm going to sign you off because you're so determined. But the determination to follow my dream made me fight a very tough illness. And I bounced back from that because it would, I would not allow it to interfere with my dream, not even for a week. A week after I had a surgery, I was back on stage and speaking with Richard Bandler, having a great time because I had a dream and my mind was like a missile. It's always moving towards that dream. And it was exciting. It was challenging. So dream big dreams. You are just as likely to make a big dream come true as a little one. If you can make a little one come true, I wanted more money. And I found $20 in the street. I wanted love and I found someone for a night. I wanted to be pregnant and I got pregnant. I didn't have a baby. See, that's a classic example of a dream not being correct. People say to me, I just want to be pregnant. I'm like, no, you don't. I do. You don't. They go, I do. I go, no, no, no. You want to conceive and carry and grow and deliver a perfect baby. You could be pregnant 10 times without a baby. That's not your dream. That's just the beginning. So if you want a baby, don't go, I want to be pregnant. Go, I want to conceive, carry to full term, grow a perfect, thriving baby. I want to deliver an amazing healthy baby. I want to have an amazing relationship with this child. And I want to grow an amazing new human being. Because your mind goes, oh, I get that. I can see that dream, but I thought you just wanted to be pregnant. No. So you see, you've got to be very specific. I keep not, my dreams don't come true. It shouldn't even be a dream. You see, when you go, I dream of finding love. I wish for love. I long for love. I hope for love. Your mind goes, well, keep dreaming, keep hoping, keep wishing. When you go, no, I will go out and find it. I am not going to sit on the sofa watching. I'm going out to find love. I'm going to believe I'm worth it. And then I'm going to put myself in front of the kind of person I want to be with. And then I'm going to find one. You see, I'm at work, work with women who I want love. And I go to yoga every day. Well, there's no men in yoga. Maybe there's one, but there's 35 women. If you want a guy, you've got to go to the weights class or the car wash or a poker school or a golf club. If, you, if you're a guy and you want to find a woman, you should go to yoga because there's not many men there. You should get out of the weights and go to the yoga. So you have to be proactive with your dream. I want to be a published author or a speaker. Well, go to Toastmasters, learn to speak. When I wanted to write a book, I wrote an article for my daughter's school magazine. It was the first time I wrote anything and they loved it. And that led me to going to that dinner, which led me to sitting next to the publisher, which led me to getting a book deal. But I didn't have the courage to write till I wrote a very small article for a magazine. But that was always my step. I didn't go, oh, I've written an article now. I can sit back at home with the potato chips and the TV. That was my step to be bigger, bigger, bigger. Dream big dreams, but don't make them dreams. Make them goals. Make them stretch. You demand more of you and know you are worth it. You can have a goal, write it out, create a mood board. If you have a dream or a goal and you create a mood board and you look at it every day, it wires it into your mind and finally get a peer group. Now, when I was writing a book, I decided I needed to put on a talk 
to get publishers there. And I told my peer group next month I'm putting on this talk. As I said it, I could think, oh, you know what? I do that in two months. I do it next year. I'd committed in front of a group of people called peers, funnily enough. Ha ha, I'm a peer. But I committed to putting on that talk. I put on that talk. Google were there. Harper and Collins turned up. I got a massive book deal. I almost cancelled it, but I kept going because I had committed. If I hadn't committed, I wouldn't have done it. When you commit to a group to doing something, your chance of doing it goes up by a whopping 80%. Find your own peer group. Commit. I'm going to take action. Taking small actions and big actions every day in the direction of your goals takes you towards your goal like a laser. So think of your goal or your dream. And instead of dreaming, take action, little actions, big actions every single day. When I wanted to be a known therapist, I would ring up a magazine or a newspaper and ask them, hey, you know, I just saw you had an article there on fire walking, but would you like to write an article on proper hypnosis for athletes? Because that's what fire walking really is. And most of them said, yes, some said no. Oh, who are you? No, thank you. But I kept going. That was my goal. Every day, make one phone call, send one email. If you get a rejection, come back. I remember vividly that sound thump. And the manuscript hit my carpet in my hall because they only send them back where they don't like them. And I heard that sound a lot. My manuscript came back and it came back and it came back. And I remember J.K. Rowling saying every time it came back, she repassed and sent it to someone else. Didn't stop to think, didn't have time to cry, just get that back in an envelope, send it to another publisher. And I did the same. She made publishing history. But I got my books published because I kept going. My dream is to be published. You might reject me, but I'll find someone else who doesn't. When a director said to Meryl Streep, Meryl, you are not beautiful enough to be an actress. She said, you know what, that's your opinion in a sea of opinions. I think I'll find another opinion. Don't let anyone burst your bubble. Diminish your dreams. The most successful who got rejected, John Lennon. Eminem, One Direction, The Beatles, so many people. Einstein was told he was educationally subnormal. John Lennon was told he was on the road to nowhere. Harry Potter got rejected by several publishers, but that didn't matter. Keep dreaming your dream, but make it a goal. Take steps, take action, believe in yourself, keep going, and dream bigger better dreams. Remember when your mind expands a new dimension, it cannot, will not, does not go back. And when you move towards your potential, it moves and it moves and it moves. Beyonce was in a band once and here she is. She's made it all on her own. Robbie Williams got fired from Take That and here he is. Piers Morgan got fired as the editor of a newspaper and here he is. Some of the most successful got fired, got dumped, got rejected, but they held on to their goal. You can too. Many people say, oh, you know, my mind and I can't control stuff and I'm just out of control and I can't change. I've always been like this. And that's not true. When you can look at what runs you, your wiring and make sense of it, you can also overcome it. So. This is one of the most powerful ways that your mind could sabotage you before you understand it and change it. And I've always found that this realization is life changing. So here's the number one way your mind sabotages you. You are hardwired and super coded to run away from what is unfamiliar and to run back to what is familiar. What does that mean? Well, it means that 500 years ago, what made you safe, what guaranteed that you could survive on the planet was staying with the familiar and avoiding the unfamiliar. Nobody who lived in a walled city or indeed a fort in the Wild West would go out for a walk late at night and go, oh, I'm, I think I'm gonna meet some new people, I'm a bit bored. 
what made you safe was same old, same old, same food, same people, same environment. And your primitive mind understands this, the familiar makes me safe. And if you've ever seen two-year-old kids, they'll say, I don't like that, it's got lumps in it. I don't want that, it's different. That's the wrong spoon, the wrong cup, the wrong story. They only like one doll, one teddy. They want the same story every night. They won't eat stuff they don't know or recognize because their primitive mind at the age of two says, if you only eat what you already know, you'll make it. And now 25 years pass and we find ourselves liking the same type of person, destructive, a heartbreaker, absent. We find ourselves going for what's familiar and nothing makes this more clear than this study. 70% of lottery winners will go bankrupt in three years if they haven't had a familiar relationship with money if they've only ever just made enough to pay the bills and had nothing left, then they will find it very hard to invest that money and keep that money. So how do you get around that? Well, first of all, understand it. Okay, I've sat on the couch for so long eating potato chips and watching TV. I've forgotten that my body is designed to run and jump and move. I've had my heart broken so many times that I now just expect that. Every job I'm in has never worked out. So it is an absolute fact that you are hardwired and super coded to go back to what you know and avoid what you don't know. But here's another fact. You can make anything you like familiar. I've seen this the most in such a simple thing. People come into my office and I might say, oh, that's a lovely coat. They go, oh, I've had it for seven years, got a hole in it. Or, oh, I heard you were the best salesperson in your team. Not really, it was just a stroke of luck. I've seen this at the lower end and right at the top. Oh, I love that movie you made. No, it wasn't very good. It won an Oscar. I know, there were no good nominations that year. But your second movie won an Oscar. I know there were even worse nominations that year. I hear you've written a best-selling book. Oh, that's just a fluke. I don't know how that came about. And I have to stop and go, oh, do you see what's happening here? I am praising you. Not only are you rejecting the praise, you're adding in criticism. You know why? In your life, praise was unfamiliar guess what was familiar of course you know being criticized and now your brain is so keen to run back to what it knows that it rejects praise and adds in criticism i just took in eight cats that are about to be euthanized tiny kittens and i saw with them that i had to hold them every day and go okay we're going to make being stroked familiar we're going to make being held familiar and very quickly they would lie in my arms like babies. If I hadn't touched them, they would have been feral. So, and that happens with babies. If you hold a baby that's never held, they go rigid, they have attachment disorder. If you don't have love or praise or money or success, you start to reject it. So how do you get around that first way your mind sabotages you? Do this, you go, I am making praise familiar. I am making success, I'm making taking sugar out of my coffee familiar. I'm making going to the gym or doing some stretches at home or really believing in myself familiar. Never add, if it kills me, if it's the last thing I do, just say I'm making it familiar. And as you do that, make all the negative stuff unfamiliar, being down on yourself, diminishing yourself criticizing yourself, make praise familiar, criticism unfamiliar, that on its own, I promise you, will change your entire life. Here is the second way your mind can sabotage you, and it's a biggie. You know, 500 years ago, we died from rejection. We lived in a tribe. If they cast you out, banished you, rejected you, marooned you, isolated you, that was a fate worse than death because it was kind of like death in Romeo and Juliet when they said, we are banishing you 
outside the city walls, he said, well, I'd rather be killed. There's nothing out there but purgatory. So we've come onto the planet with a fear of rejection because it wasn't that long ago that we died from rejection. But now we don't die from rejection. Now, safety isn't a numbers game. We don't need to live in a big tribe to know we belong. We can live on our own and make it to 102. But we still feel as if rejection will kill us. And you know how this is real? Listen to some songs. I'll die if you leave me. I can't live without you. My life is over without you. You're the only one for me. I can't go on. I can't live if living is without you. Well, none of that's true. Most people have been in a lovely relation, got dumped, it hurts, and they find someone else. I've been dumped, I'm sure you've been dumped. I had my heart broken, I guess you have too. But then we found someone even better. So you have to not fear rejection. People say to me, you know, I, I want to be a speaker, but I'm terrified of going on stage. I want to be an actor, but what if I get rejected? Well, what if you get rejected? Who cares? Look at your life, how much have you been rejected? That kid at school that rejected you, the first job that fired you, the person that dumped you, but you're still here. Rejection can be the best thing that ever happens to you if you can bounce back. And here's the third way that we sabotage ourselves. We tell ourselves lies and we believe them. I can't cope. I'm in overwhelm, I'm dying under the pressure, this stress is killing me, this job, the death of me, these kids will be the death of me. This is killing me, driving me crazy, making me go insane. You see, this is not true. If you are prepared to lie to yourself on a daily basis, I'm a big fat pig, I haven't slept for a week, I'm exhausted, my headache is killing me. If you're prepared to lie to yourself, which is okay, we all do it, at least tell yourself a better lie. I'm amazing, I have phenomenal coping skills, challenging clients teach me the best. I have a super fast metabolic rate. I'm magnetically lovable. People say that's not true. Neither is saying stress is killing me, I eat like a pig, I'm an out of control train wreck. None of them are true, but you might as well tell yourself a better lie I can only tell you it will change your entire life. Now you've heard of Stockholm Syndrome where people attach themselves to their captives to feel safe. In Homeland, Brody attached himself to his captors. And that happens. We, we attach ourselves to people because of our fear of rejection, our need to make, to stay with what is familiar, and our ability to respond to the lies we tell ourselves. And with coronavirus, we've got this whole thing now where it's actually become so familiar to be at home that something, oh my God, I don't know how I'm gonna cope now. I've got used to lounging around, lying on the sofa, not pushing myself, not going out, and now I'm going out, it's feeling unfamiliar. So we have to make what was comfortable, uncomfortable, what is uncomfortable, comfortable. Check out my next video here and download my free self-esteem boosting workbook right here. The way you feel about anything at any time is down to two things, the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself. And number one habit to start.